Oh, we're in for a wild ride with this CPU launch. I got a Core Ultra 9 285K and a Core Ultra 5 245K. Oh man, this is a mixed bag. Uh, on the one hand, I don't know if these CPUs were really ready to launch, but on the other hand, there's a few things here that are, that are fantastic and show that Intel is making some much needed and long overdue progress and changes to the way that it thinks about its tech ecosystem and how CPUs should be built. It's simultaneously exciting, but also a little bit scary. The Wall Street Bros are going to gin up even more fear mongering that Intel has lost its way and oh my gosh, the dividends are gone. There's no break room snacks. Gamers are going to say that well, gamers are going to say a lot of bad things, and I suspect most of the reviews are really not going to be that positive. But this CPU, this CPU represents the dawn of a new age for Intel. No, it's not the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Wow, that's a really old reference. Let's start with the hardware. All right, so I've got the Asus Maximus Z890 Hero and the 360mm Ryujin, Ryujin cooler, building this out in my own Asus ProArt Super Tower case. The thing is that uh, motherboard variants, I've got several Z890 motherboards from MSRI and ASRock, and there's more performance variation between the boards than I would expect. If you want even more content around this launch, check out the Level 1 Linux channel where I built around the MSI Z890 Ace for launch day testing there as well. As for the CPUs themselves, well, this CPU is made of five or six different pieces of silicon, tiles in Intel's vernacular, five or six, depending on if you want to count the filler tile or not. In this, the Core Ultra 9, there's eight performance cores and 16 efficiency cores, while in the Ultra 5, you get six performance cores and eight efficiency cores. So that's 24 cores and 24 threads. Intel's done away with hyper-threading this generation or 14 cores and 14 threads for the Core Ultra 5. 5.7 gigahertz max boost for the Ultra 9 and 5.2 gigahertz max boost for the Ultra 5. You've probably already looked at the specs if you're watching this video on, on day one, or even if you're not on day one. And on paper, this looks like a reduction, a regression from the max to boost performance and at least the thread count, I mean over 14th gen and 13th gen and 12th gen, well, to a lesser extent 12th gen. Now one of the things that may be holding Arrow Lake back for gaming is memory latency because of the chiplets and the tiles and everything else. When I first started testing, it was tough to achieve less than 100 nanoseconds of memory latency. 130 nanoseconds is what I saw out of the box. Fortunately, MSI dropped an update for their Z890 Ace, and now I can pretty regularly get 80 nanoseconds, even 79. Curiously, consistently, the Core Ultra 5 has slightly, slightly better memory latency, and the memory latency does contribute to better overall game performance. The first sign of trouble might be Geekbench though. Our single core scores are worse than the 14th gen i9. Yeah, the Ultra 9 also packs a neural processing unit, an NPU, and that tops out at 35 tops. <laughs> tops out, see what I did there? So Geekbench AI and AI benchmarks like Procyon, those are looking pretty good for this desktop CPU. And in other artificial benchmarks, like Time Spy and Firestrike, oh, Firestrike, things don't look so bad in Firestrike. This actually could be good for gaming, but in real world gaming scenarios, well, let's take a closer look at those. Looks like we're starting to win some and we're starting to lose some. I decided to focus comparisons on the 14900K and the 7800X 3D. For the games that I picked, I'm seeing about 7% loss on average, maybe a little worse across a wide variety of games when we compare the 7800X 3D to the Core Ultra 285K. Even at higher resolutions, there are more likely, you know, to be problems. I mean, it's, it's CPU bound. I'd, I'd expect the 1% lows at the 95th percentile to be a little bit better. It's not even, I mean, the 14900K is doing better. I even tried disabling virtualization-based security. Sometimes virtualization-based security can hamper gaming performance, but when doing that, easy anti-cheat will crash or blue screen, which led to data corruption, which Intel actually said, yes, I have discovered a bug. So that's interesting. There's a bulletin for that that Intel has issued. So you can't really disable Intel virtualization. You're left with disabling virtualization by security in Windows, which doesn't always disable it because the GUI's buggy. It's also possible to get a blue screen of death immediately on a fresh Windows installation. This would happen if you have a third party GPU installed like Nvidia or AMD, but Windows Update downloads the driver for that GPU before the iGPU, or otherwise somehow you get GPU drivers installed before you get the iGPU driver. If you take out the add-in card and then install the driver, driver for the iGPU or disable the iGPU in BIOS and then use the add-in card, it won't blue screen. But it's worrying that quality control didn't catch that. 
So let's talk power consumption for a second. Power consumption at the wall, bottom line, the 285K is more efficient than the 14900K and definitely the 14900KS. But it's tricky to talk about that. So I got a difference of about 43 watts, real world difference for the same gaming performance. And it's about 43 watts at the wall too, which is not just the CPU, that's a, kind of a best case scenario for gaming as well. Like general best case scenario, I guess is how I would describe it. The ROG system behind me has an auxiliary six pin power input. And it looks like the board might be using some of the power inputs to help the CPU power instead of just the CPU power inputs. So show me where the power is irregular on the motherboard. Have you tried turning yourself off and on? So I felt like the only option that I had to measure here was usage at the wall, which is not as accurate if you only want specifically CPU power consumption comparisons. So that was slightly irritating. I got about 43 watts by locking the game at 100, uh, so it was 100 FPS exactly on the 4090, which was achievable on the 4900K and the Core Ultra 285K at stock settings. And for many gaming workloads, the CPU is already gonna use way less power than max power anyway, no matter what generation of CPU you've got. Max power is really only for those multi-core workloads, rendering, blender, you know, that kind of thing, generally. So this is a win for Arrow Lake, but it was also possible to configure 13th and 14th gen Intel, Intel CPUs to not guzzle power either and still get good performance. It's just that Arrow Lake can be, you know, better. And Arrow Lake can guzzle power. If guzzling power is your thing and you want to dump 300 watts through your Arrow Lake CPU, you can totally do that as long as you can keep it cool. It's more efficient out of the box, but it's not dramatically more efficient out of the box. It is possible to make it more dramatically efficient in a best case scenario to a worst case scenario. But really, uh, I don't think the power conversation is all that interesting. Related to this is Intel APO, Application Performance Optimization. What this software is meant to do is on a game-by-game -game basis, provide performance profiles to optimize how the individual game's threads and resource allocation is managed by the operating system. APO really does not do much to deliver on that promise today, however. It's not really ready yet, in my opinion, but this kind of thing really is needed, probably was needed two or three generations ago. Like, APO has promise. It's good. I don't want to get too much in the weeds with this video, but I think this is going to be an important thing to talk about because APO really is important and APO can make a difference. There's about five games that I found where it made more than a 5% difference, meaning that it can improve performance about 5% on the new Intel CPUs, including Shadow of the Tomb Raider. But it was sort of an odd mix of games. Most games is on the order of like two, 3% performance improvement with APO. And it was a bit of a mixed bag on the boards. Some boards had APO options enabled and some boards did not. So you're, it's up to you to configure APO if you want, because there's a BIOS component of APO, that application performance optimization. The other thing is also the power profile. So if you do balanced power profile or high performance, if you do high performance, the system will sit at a higher idle power utilization, but it will perform better in games. I don't think it's really reasonable to expect gamers to change to a high profile, high performance profile, and then change to a balanced profile when they're not gaming. So if you talk about power savings and power performance, like balance should work correctly, and then we have APO doing its thing, why doesn't APO set the power profile appropriately? It's interesting. And so I think it's worth considering the whole gamut of benchmarks that you're going to see across uh, the tech space today and in the days following the launch of the CPU. And for everybody in our audience that's been using Process Lasso to try to tackle uh, this sort of <laughs> operating system chaos and like, is the game running on an efficiency core? We don't know. Yeah, Process Lasso is kind of approached that, but it is nice to see Intel putting engineering resources into doing that. I fully think that we're going to see user land hooks in operating system schedulers in Windows. That's already a thing in Linux. It already can work really well in Linux. And we already sort of kind of need to be there in Windows like three generations ago. And APO is the first step toward that. So that's great. That's, that's good. Good job, Intel. Bottom line, what's the verdict? I don't think this platform was ready to launch quite yet. It shows a lot of promise. I don't know if Intel can close the gap in the weeks and months following launch. 
When Zen 5 launched, I think it's fair to say pretty much universally everyone was disappointed. Zen 5%. But Intel hasn't clearly shown even a 5% lead over their 14900K, and I think that's a real problem because, like I say, the engineering prowess and the engineering win here is significant. But in terms of like a product gamers would buy, well, you know, Anantech is dormant now, but there was some wisdom to come out of the uh, founding leadership of Anantech. There are no bad products, there are only bad prices. Really, for gamers, it's going to come down to price. What gets it done? And unfortunately for Intel, their older products get it done, and competing products get it done, at perhaps a better price point. It's nice to have the newer technology in the new CPUs, and there's no arguing with the multi-core performance, but for gamers, I don't know. The pricing on launch, it's a little rough. Oh yeah, uh, Windows 2152, it's a new insider build, and it does actually help Arrow Lake, but it doesn't help Arrow Lake significantly. There wasn't enough time to retest all the games again, and who's gonna run a Windows Insider preview? When is that gonna be released? Windows 24H2 doesn't include that update, but the 2152 update does improve things for Arrow Lake. It's not just a scheduler problem though, it's different geometry in the system. Like even just Geekbench single thread, yes, that's running on a P-Core. One P-Core running in a high performance power profile. Uh, with a little bit of an overclock, you can get 21, 2200, but it's not significantly faster. Now, compilers and things like that may change the game. We'll know on Linux. Linux is our canary in the coal mine. And with Linux, uh, you know, when Zen 5 launched, there was a huge difference between Zen 5 on Linux and Zen 5 on Windows. With Arrow Lake, there's not as much of a difference between Arrow Lake on Linux and Arrow Lake on Windows. So I'm really skeptical about how much of a performance improvement is gonna happen with 2152 overall. It's gonna be a little bit of a performance improvement, but they're not gonna pull 15% performance uplift out of that single update. One thing that is really exciting is Intel clearly has the memory controller competitive advantage. And so if Intel can take that memory controller competitive advantage and the next generation of performance and efficiency cores are even better, then they may have a, a product to be reckoned with. At the same time, maybe this gives their competition some ideas. You know, 8800CU DIMMs with 120 gigabytes per second memory transfer on just a few cores, that is very nice for single user systems. So we'll see, the future is gonna be interesting no matter which way you cut the cheese. But that's enough for now. All right, I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level 1 forums. Let's chat.